Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. I'm Mariam, an internal medicine trainee who joined a UK medical practice using PLAP pathway. Today I'm going to explain more about PLAP2 frequently asked questions. So what is PLAP2? It is the second part of the UK medical licensing exam. From early 2024, it will be replaced by UKMLA, which UKMLA itself has two parts, AKT and CPSA, or the Clinical and Professional Skills Assessment, which CPSA is an equivalent of PLAP2. PLAP2 is an OSCE exam. It is meant to reflect real life scenarios and settings to cover everything a UK trained doctor might expect to see on the first day of foundation year two. So what are the requirements for PLAP2? You need a valid PLAP1 exam, which should be within two years of your PLAP1, and you need proof of identification, for example, passport, and you need to be in the UK. There's no need to have a valid English test or have your EPIC verification for the PLAP2. How much does it cost and what are the refund policies? Currently, exam costs £906 if your booking is between the 1st of April 2022 to the 31st of March 2023. But after the first day of the upcoming April, exam costs £934. Expensive, isn't it? <laughs> Cancellation fees are usually variable, especially after the pandemic, but it can be around £90 if you cancel well in advance and no refund if you cancel within 28 days of the exam. Of course, there are certain situations the GMC will fully refund, but it's negotiated individually, um, cases like visa refusal, illness, or any other valid situation. So what are the exam dates? Are they like PLAP1, having four different dates a year? No. So exam is usually held throughout the year with no exam on Sundays and bank holidays. So you have a range of dates to choose from. It is not always easy to find a SID, especially if it's right after PLAP1 result re release. But given it is an OSCE exam and people need to travel to the UK, there may be many cancellations, especially close to the exam date. How many attempts are acceptable? You should clear your PLAP2 in maximum four attempts. It's not always easy to pass it on the first attempt, especially because of the OSCE nature of the exam. If you fail your exam for four times, you should undertake further learning to improve your medical knowledge and clinical skills for at least 12 months, either in a clinical practice setting or postgraduate qualification. Then you may be eligible for a further attempt, but remember to check requirement for acceptable clinical practice or postgrad qualification in the GMC website. So what is the exam setting like? The exam is held in two different locations in Manchester, where the GMC is, 3 Hartman Square and 3 Hartman Street. It has 16 different scenarios with at least two rest stations. So you can imagine in every OSCE round, 18 candidates are attending. You have eight minutes to complete a station and between 90 to 105 seconds, depending on your venue, to travel between stations and read the instructions for the next scenario. Do not panic, it's more than enough. There are three types of stations, ones with mannequins or other equipment, ones with an actor who plays the role of a patient and ones with only a telephone. You will be observed at all time during the exam. There are always cameras and microphones in the room. You might find the examiner sitting in the room or the examiner might be over the phone with you. In terms of content, you also have different types of stations. You have clinical examinations, clinical procedures, history taking and medical management. You've got consultation, ethical scenarios and teaching scenarios. These stations can be from different areas of medicine. But once you start working in the UK, you'd be surprised how common these scenarios are in your day-to-day -day job. How am I assessed in the exam? During each station, you will be assessed against three different domains. The first one is data gathering, technical and assessment skills. For example, how you take the history, how you examine your patient, how you do the practical procedures or, or what investigations you request to lead to a diagnosis. Second one is the clinical management skills, like how you formulate a diagnosis, how you explain something to a patient, and how you formulate the management plan. Last but not least is the interpersonal skills. From the moment you step into the room, you will be assessed for this skill until you leave the room. You will be evaluated how you establish a rapport with the patient, how you use different techniques in asking questions, 
how much you involve patient in formulating a management plan, and overall, how you demonstrate your professionalism and understanding of different ethical principles. Later on, I will make a separate video on explaining the results and scoring for PLAT2, which could be translated into different OSCE exams in the UK as well. In terms of preparation for PLAT2, in a separate video, I will discuss how myself and different peers prepare for the exam and what resources are available out there. So the interesting question of what can I wear for the exam? Clearly, there's a dress code. The exam is meant to simulate a clinical setting. Hence, you need to dress professionally. You can check out the NHS guidance for uniforms and workwear for detailed information. But to make it short and concise, follow the bare below the elbow policy. It means short sleeved or rolled up sleeves, no watch, no jewellery. You can wear a simple wedding ring like that. Clean and short nails, no nail polish, gel colour or false nails. Tidy your hair and tie long hair back. Tuck the tie into your shirt or pants. Wear comfortable shoes covering over the whole foot or toes, no sandals, and I could say avoid high heels as much as possible. Overall, look professional and at the same time comfortable. Um, here is a picture of myself on the exam day in front of the Three Hartman Square building. I think everyone has such picture. I've got a Zara fine neat turtleneck jumper on and an H&M classic pants with Clark's loafer. I found it quite comfortable and at the same time professional. So what happens on the day? You appear to your venue with an ID. Initially, you will be ID checked for your GMC registration. You then get a sticker with your name and the station number you start from. You can leave your belongings in a locker and wait in a room. Coffee, tea and biscuits are provided. One of the invigilators will debrief you on what to expect and some do's and don'ts before you start. Then you walk towards the stations. You get to each station one by one. But don't forget to sanitize your hands right before walking into a new station. Drink water, visit the loo and have a biscuit during your rest of the station as well. So, what to do after the exam? Do not overthink it. You would never know for sure how you performed. You might have performed great in a specific station, but the passing the score is much higher and you failed. On the contrary, you might feel that station was terrible, but you end up passing the station as passing the score was much lower. Very important, do not share exam content in any way. So this is a misconduct and can lead to a penalty. Many academies might approach you about finding details of the exam, which is again a misconduct. Rest assured that exam was a great experience. If you passed, well, that's a... <laughs> if not, you will receive the exam with more realistic expectations of the exam and of course more experience. Start working on documents you need for the GMC registration. Do your English test if it's expired work on your CV, and of course, look for a clinical attachment. What is the passing a score for the exam? There are two factors you should meet to pass the exam. First one, you must at least pass a minimum of 10 stations. And second one, you must at least meet the minimum total passing a score, which is variable for each exam day, so you would never know. If you fail, Unfortunately, you cannot have your results checked again, as GMC is pretty confident that their marking system is robust. In the next few videos, I will talk about understanding the scoring system and how to study for the exam. So stay tuned. Don't forget to subscribe and share this video with whoever might find this video helpful.